Okay, folks. Let's get this microphone back in place where I can use it. Hope you guys are having a great, great day. <clears throat> Today we are hopping into publication. My plan right now is to really spend about two weeks of the stream um, talking about publishing because there's a lot that goes into it. Um, if you've been keeping up with the channel and um, according to the numbers, no one really has. <laughs> if you're keeping up with the channel, then uh, you'll notice that I've been putting out a video on uh, everything you need to know for publication every single day. So I started with um, an overview that's the sequence of what we're going to be doing and what I want to go through. And uh, this is just something that maybe I probably could have done better before I launched this whole thing is just really take into account, um, really, really have a realistic look of how, how many pieces of information there are to know how to publish. Once you know the process, it's easy and you can actually do everything that we're going to do like in a day. And that's if you know what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's going to take a lot longer to self-learn it. And that's basically what I had to do. So I had to, everything that I'm going to show you today, I had to teach to myself. I had to learn it through just bashing my head against the wall, checking forums. There was very little information for a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about I hear, particularly cover design. Um, there's only a couple of YouTube channels and a couple of websites that will really talk accurately about what goes into a proper book cover. Um, one of them is a guy named actually Derek Murphy who does like writing courses and other stuff like that. But um, other than that, I can't think of anyone on YouTube who breaks down what's in a cover the way I did in the video today. Uh, and that's really important because you can learn, so you can go to graphic design school or you can go to a school and learn, you know, learn how to use Photoshop, be like an expert Photoshop user and still produce terrible looking book covers because you don't know what has to be in the book cover. You don't know how they're supposed to look or you haven't taken the time to analyze what they're supposed to, to look like and what they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do from a marketing perspective. Uh, perspective. So it's it's important that you are are really willing to do a little bit of learning there, but there's there's virtually no one who teaches it. This is stuff that isn't really taught at the university level or in any workshop that I've ever seen, other than a couple of scattered ones, which of course, like this one, are outside of the university system. Um, so it's something that we, we kind of have to dig into. It's something I had to learn myself. Uh, I had a little bit of a graphic design background. I taught myself graphic design back in the 90s. Uh, when computers and computer-aided graphic design was new and you did most things in a program called Quark Express. It came to like magazine design and things like that, which was a basically a Photoshop add-on. All right, so we used Photoshop back in the 90s and boy, has it uh, exploded and, and grown. Um, so I, what I wanted to do today anyway, <laughs> I'll give a little bit of uh, channel news and a little bit of I guess some other news regarding what we're going to do to finish up today and, and next week. And then I would like to give a little bit of a live demonstration of a like a basic book cover design and talk a little bit about how you're going to then the process to take a, an ebook cover is what we're going to start with. And then we're going to actually uh, take that ebook cover and we're going to turn it into a full paperback cover and it's actually not that hard to do once you have it now if you commission an ebook cover hopefully they will also do a wrap cover that goes all the way around like the, something like this um, if you don't commission that or you just commission the ebook cover you buy a pre-made book cover it's very easy to turn it into a wrap and that's something that I'm gonna go over in a video this week um, and so what I wanted the live streams to do is focus more on questions and things like that that you could get kind of a live uh, answer and response to. By the way, people have been emailing me book cover designs. I It may take me a couple days to get to those because I'm very rarely at my computer. Um, I'm only at my computer like basically late at night. It's um, That's just kind of how it is for me right now. It's, it's, it's a pretty busy schedule. So let me take a look at the chat, see what's going on, and then, um, then we'll maybe talk about executing book cover design because I, that might be a fun thing to do live. <laughs> And we'll talk about how you actually go about converting that into, you know, uh, a full size, a full size cover. Um, some of the programs, before I jump into this, some of the programs that I recommend, if you have access to Adobe Photoshop, like if you have, say, a, um, 
a university, you know, university subscription if you're if you're still at the university or you're at a college. If you have ac access to it on a college workstation, or you can get an educational discount or something for it, it's it's probably one of the most powerful programs that you can have at your disposal if you know how to use it just for everything that you're going to do as an author besides like word processing but word processing is so basic you can get you can work with like open office or LibreOffice or microsoft word for very very cheap i still use my copy of microsoft word from 2010 just to put things in perspective and uh, why upgrade it they haven't added any functionality i really care about other than the ability to maybe work online which i may jump into that because having to copy and move from google docs is not it's not it's just not ideal uh, you know it works fine and i've actually done a lot of writing in google docs for the new book so uh, i'll do that now i can't talk about the cover th for that one because i was going to i was working with an artist and um, we're just a little bit behind on that it's okay i'm a little bit behind on actually getting the the manuscript polished up and finished because um, I wanted to change some things and just takes a little time to do that. And I've been really busy with other stuff with YouTube. So let's talk about channel news. Um, so some of you who follow me on Twitter, I'm at David B. Stewart, caught that I made another channel. Uh, and this is just a, it's a channel called StoryCraft. And all it is is it's going to be a home for the, um, all the story-based content that uh, I put out on this channel. So it's gonna be exclusively that content, um, you know, from now on, uh, on that channel. So all it's right now it's gonna be all old content. Um, and so I have a whopping like nine views on everything, but I do recommend you subscribe to that because at some point this channel um, will have difficulty continuing. And right now it's actually having difficulty continuing. Uh, just to be completely transparent about things like my you know, my views and everything have collapsed about 80%. Um, and it happened very quickly. Like one week it was this, next week it was this. And so it's taken basically a full month for me to get all the analytics in for how everything's doing. And I saw this drop off a couple of months ago. And so I quickly adjusted seeing the drop off um, and I adjusted what I was doing. So I quadrupled my my content output and it kind of evened out so my total views stayed the same but i was putting out four to five times as much content i was releasing content every day sometimes two times a day um, and i did that for like eight weeks and uh, last week i had to take a couple days off because a bunch of other things got in the way of me making content usually that's not a big deal but then you could really see the drop and so um, definitely the channel is being throttled it's um you know, it's blacklist status or whatever that is, and I'm not sure exactly what's causing it. I do know that me talking about it right now will cause this video to be demonetized. So that is something universal is that because I've talked about demonetization, that throttles things down. Um, whenever you talk about um, in, any forbidden topics, even if you talk about them from the editorial perspective that Google likes, it, uh, it crashes the video, it'll demonetize it. So. Um, I've been a bad boy for a very long time, in other words, and so now the channel's suffering big time for it. I'm continually having people tell me, I didn't know you put out all these videos. I clicked your channel and all of a sudden I realized I missed 40 videos and YouTube was never telling me that you, I have the bell and everything. They were never telling me you uploaded anything. The videos were not on the landing page. Um, the thing is, is that if you are a content creator, you rely on a couple of things. First of all, it's subscribers who actually want to watch the content. Um, and the other one is actually for YouTube, for the YouTube algorithm to show your content to new people who are interested in it and are going to be engaged. So, um, if you're a writer and you kind of, let's say you kind of, um, you hop into what I'm doing like last year, excuse me, I need to sneeze probably in a second. <coughs> Sorry. A little bit of allergies cause it's fall. Very dusty here. Um, so let's say you hopped into what I was doing last year. And you got enough lessons that you evolved out of that, right? You're not really interested in hearing more of my analysis content because you're doing your own thing or there's something else you're interested in. So what I need Google to do is to show that highly relevant content for writers to new people who are looking for that writing content so that there's kind of a flow in and a flow out. Well, YouTube's not showing my content to anyone. 
not even the people who are subscribed at this point. So there's no one coming in to replace the people who are just kind of losing interest. It's very difficult to maintain relevancy on YouTube for a long period of time with any subject matter. Um, but I've seen a big drop off and I know that this is not, you know, I know it's not a function of like content being wrong or something, you know, cause I didn't change the content. The content was the same and then everything collapsed. Like I got to adjust and try something new. Um, and so that's what, that's how it is. So just to put things in perspective, like my videos this week have been getting 200 views. Now I'm used to 2000, even on content. That's my lo lower pop, lower popularity stuff would used to be 2000. My higher popularity stuff used to be 15, 20,000. And then my viral stuff was 200,000, 300,000 views. Uh, now there's nothing like that. I'll only get like some viral attention if um, a larger publication that has its own audience happens to link to one of my videos. So if like Breitbart has one of my videos in one of their articles or Forbes or someone like that happens to link back to something I said, then boom, then I get like a bunch of traffic. But there's no organic, no organic growth right now. So um, it's actually very, very bad. Um, I have a bit shoot. It's, it's linked in every single video, uh, Kyle. It's in the description box and every single video I have a bit shoot, so you can check it out. The problem, there's problems with bit shoot is bit shoot doesn't have this algorithm working where it's gonna funnel people into their interests. That was the benefit of YouTube is you used to be able to open up YouTube and YouTube would evaluate what you were doing. I know this sounds kind of, maybe it sounds kind of Orwellian or creepy, but evaluate what you're doing and be like, oh, you like Sonic the Hedgehog videos? Here's some Sonic the Hedgehog videos and it would just show you more of what you liked and what you click that like button on and what you engaged with. It would just show you more of that. Well, now it it might show you more, but it's not showing you more of what you want, it's showing you more of what they want you to see. So if I were to open up a YouTube landing page in incognito right now, what you'd see is a bunch of CNN garbage. So you see a bunch of corporate stuff replacing creators right away is one of the things you'll see. And that's part of it. So most creators I know, they're, they're in the toilet. If you're on the right, you're in the toilet, you've been flushed down and you're sitting in like a bucket of crap. Um, Stefan Molyneux came out with a video just a couple days ago. Basically, he's had about an 80%. It seems like about 80% for everybody. We've lost about 80% of what we're doing. So 80% of the revenue is gone. 80% of the views are gone. Um, and that's bad. So I've been at 36,000 subscribers. Like, So the growth was really steady and then it hit 36,000. And all my viewership dropped off and it, YouTube's not showing my content to anyone. So that means to me this this channel's blacklisted on some level. It's uh, It's heavily throttled. So, so for me to preserve what I've done, to preserve the channel, because the next step is they're going to ban me. So I expect to be banned at some point in 2020, um, leading up to the election, because I won't be able to keep my mouth shut. I'm a very naughty boy. So when that happens, I need to preserve the work that I've done on some other platform or some other YouTube channel so other people can use it. Um, so please do subscribe to that other channel. I don't Did I link it? Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. There it is. Okay. So that's that other channel. Of course, you can find um, my bit shoot. My and I'm gonna I'm gonna mirror everything on this channel always. So if you like all the content, you can stay subscribed to this. If you just want story content, you can subscribe to that channel and ignore this one a little bit more. You actually won't have to ignore this channel because YouTube will be helping you ignore it very actively. Um, and that's kind of what's going on. I don't like to pull the pull the veil off and like talk about YouTube uh, because YouTube. YouTube's AI responds by destroying you for talking about YouTube. Um, there's a bunch of metadata problems in YouTube right now. We don't need to get too deep into it, but but basically my past videos are seriously harming my channel today. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. So I need to, you know, looking at it this weekend, I, I just had kind of a come to Jesus moment of like I have to change something about what I'm doing. I kind of shunted the bleeding for a couple of weeks by upping the amount of content I did, but that comes at an expense because if I'm spending six hours on a Saturday making content and hours on hours on a Wednesday making content for the rest of the week, even short videos sometimes take longer than you realize because you have to sit down and figure out what you're going to say, maybe write it down. I don't do a whole lot of writing down. Sometimes I have notes, but uh, it takes a lot of thought to even just talk for five minutes, even someone that's experienced with it as me. Imagine if somebody else, one of your favorite creators, does a lot of editing, right? So they may come out with one video a week and expect to get a lot of views on it to support their channel. And if they, their views drop by 80%, we're talking in one month, they don't have enough money to continue their channel. 
So it could be much worse for other people that uh, aren't in the situation where I am, where YouTube is, YouTube to me, I don't really use the money. It's just part of my business. I don't access it. It just, um, it, it basically, I don't live on YouTube. I'm not, I'm not required to. Um, and I, I'm glad that I kept it that way uh, rather than looking at that as like an income source that I should use. You know what I mean? I've used some of the money, you know, for equipment. I've used some of the money for this and that. But for the most part, um, it's part of savings. I'd rather use the lump sum to do something in my house. Anyway, let's take a look at the chat. And then maybe we'll we'll get into some fun stuff. Let's see how many people are watching right now. Because this is the other thing about live streaming. There's 33, there's 33 people watching. Just to give you, you know, a little bit more info. Typical live stream six months ago was several hundred. <laughs> you know, it was over 100. And then like my popular ones would be like 300 people, 400 people watching. If I was going to like talk about Star Wars or something fun like that. Um, but 33 people is actually, you know, that's a classroom full of people. And I'm doing something very technical and academic. So it, I'm expecting it to be less than normal. <laughs> but at the same time, like that's not a lot of people. Um, so that's how it is. Um, things are things are pretty rough for the channel right now. Uh, Taku says he's been watching all the videos. I appreciate that. Um, how do I find a publisher that won't rip me off or screw me over? That is a question that's too complicated for me to answer. Most publishers are not going to rip you off or screw you over, um, but some will. And in fact, there's lots of horror stories about big name publishers doing really shady things like refusing to turn over publishing rights and them also refusing to publish the book because of wrong think that happened with the um the chronicles of counter earth the novels of gore um Tara Parr says i'm really glad you're covering all this stuff especially these last bits it's part of the process the most confusing yes that's why i'm trying to make a lot of videos on it <laughs> first time on the stream but watch them all I want to say thanks especially because of the cover design info never before had i considered marketing my photoshop design experience in the form of pre-made covers oh yeah dude if you're good at this stuff so zbr if you're good at this stuff you could set up a website come up with a brand name you know 99 designs is a big one that has a bunch of graphic artists that i've seen like rocking book covers advertised before just come up with one that that's a brand name and take these principles that i've shown and you're probably more skilled with this stuff than i am and um look at the most some of the most popular genres on on um amazon it's going to be stuff like fantasy and sci-fi and romance and just pump out a bunch of covers you can do it really easy if you have, if you're already working and you have a subscription to a, a stock photo website of some kind, then it's just going to be gravy. Like I've thought about doing that, I just don't have time to sit and do a bunch of pre-made book covers. I actually have had a couple out. I've I've designed covers for other people, kind of on the on the spare time. Um, so that's a good idea. I mean, you can make money with that, and if it's if it's a, an hour of your time and you can sell it for fifty bucks, fifty bucks an hour, that's really good. That's good money, and in, and you could do if it's two hours of your time and you sell it for a hundred bucks, you know, that's good. <laughs> Winter's Gate, Itaku's title. I like that. Winter's Gate sounds like a good fantasy book. Words like winter. Dragons of Autumn's Twilight. <laughs> I was looking at this book cover earlier. This is a great painted book cover. It's far more colorful than I would actually recommend for most people, but it actually has a couple of key colors, which is purple and orange, which are uh, Twilight colors. That's also some colors that Twilight Force likes to use a lot for a good reason. They evoke feelings of fall and uh, sunset. That's kind of like the colors outside of my house right now. If I were to actually brave the outside, they're kind of purple. Um, I have an idea for a mystery series in, in the vein of Nancy Drew. Should I publish it and my Eldritch book under different names? No, I don't think you need to. I don't think you need to. I mean, early on, you're just trying to attract attention. There might be a lot of cross cross pollination there between mystery and horror, especially Lovecraftian horror. Um, Lovecraft horror is kind of has a mystery element, so there might be a lot of crossover there. It depends if you're the Nancy Drew one is specifically for children, 
you might want to use a different name or at least like a variation. So like you could do, you know, Hardwick Bentho for one, you could do HW Bentho or something for the children's one. I'm worried about taken in by a vanity publisher who won't do just do not use vanity publishers ever. You should never pay to publish. That's why I'm putting this out. I probably didn't make this clear enough. You never pay to publish. Either the publisher pays you an advance or pays you royalties to publish or you publish it yourself. Okay? So never use a vanity publisher. I've put out content on this under any circumstances. I can't think of a single circumstance where you'd want to. The only circumstance I could think of, you would be better off doing it yourself, which would be if you were going to use the publisher to to print a bunch of books, which then you were going to sell out of the trunk of your car if you were, say, a comedian that was traveling around. Thing is, you could do all that yourself for less money and probably less hassle and have the rights to your book. Don't use a vanity publisher. Absolutely do not. How do I even do any publishing? What website to use? I have literally no idea. I've watched my video series. I have all the info. I'm going to talk about what websites you're going to use, how to format your eBooks, how to upload those, how to price them. Those are all coming down the pipeline. Um, just to give a brief overview, you you format your book as an eBook um, on on Amazon. Uh, you you can upload it just as a Word doc, and it'll convert it to to Kindle no problem as long as your Word document is properly formatted. Some people try to make a full um, full Mobi file, which is actually what the Amazon file is, um, and then upload it that way. But uh, you can do it either way you want. doesn't matter. You just upload it, and then it sells it at whatever price you want to sell it for. And they'll even make a cover for you. Amazon will even has like a little cover creator that will just like do the cover for you. <laughs> so it works. Pretty. It, it's pretty basic. It's uh, KDP. Um and I could just put the website in. It's just kdp.amazon.com. I'm going to show you how to use that. Let's see here. Is book cover design an okay place to associate your brand as an overall author to your audience, or should I stick solely to communicating things like genre, tone? Or are those the same? I'm not sure what the question means. You want to, if you're talking about how you design your book cover or what you want out of a book cover design, you want mainly genre tone, but you can brand. I mean, branding can be part of that. I mean, like if your author name, if you want a slightly stylized font for your author name that kind of is immediately recognizable and, and you can come up with something good, you can do that. Um, <clears throat> other people brand through the title of their books. They use like the word magic in a series. So every book in the series has, you know, immortal magic, powerful magic, purple magic, like it's everything magic. Um, and so that, that keyword magic's really, really queuing hard into the bots. Um, so you can do stuff like that font, you know, if, like there's a font that works for every part of a series that works. Um, it's so dumb that YouTube is so paranoid about what people think. It's not, you know... Paranoid. I don't know about paranoid. I think they're they know that they were they participated in the election of Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, by the way, they 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 censor any time you mention BitChute. <laughs> so they'll, they'll be like message held for review. I'm like you mentioned BitChute, competitor. Um, welcome to 1984 YouTube edition. It's been like this for a while. It's just rather than banning people outright. They banned some people outright, like Bard got banned, um, but they just cut off everybody else from the from the algorithm. So we can't grow the channel, can't replace the people who lose interest, which is part of the, the business. And so it sucks. I don't know, maybe I need to quit. And then I then like I have to put luckily I don't have all my eggs in one basket. Then I, I have to divide my time into music and and books and just do something else for video content. I just can't do video content anymore. Like, there's no point to do it. Like, okay, I don't, it's saying, oh, I don't do it for the money. It's like, if nobody's watching it and it's generating me no income, what's the point of doing it? Like, what's the sound of one hand clapping? If no one's gonna watch the content, there's no reason for me to continue doing it. Um, it's, it's really that simple. Like, it's not gonna make me any money, so I could be making money elsewhere, and it's also not getting me any attention so that I, I can't make money by selling books. 
and I'm not communicating anything that I think is important because no one's watching, right? My, my favorite content is the most throttled content. I came out with a content piece of content called Noise, how the news makes you know less and feel bad. That was I, I, I took a whole month off to evaluate the news and social media, and I I just uh, I did a couple attempts, and I came out with this philosophical kind of Nietzschean rant through through news. It's like everyone who watched it says it was great, but like YouTube won't show it to anyone. It's completely throttled. Same thing with the Virgin versus Chad one. So it's like I'm like this is the best literary analysis I've ever done, and like no one can see it, and I can't run ads on it. That's really it's really disheartening to have that. Um, it would be like showing up to work and finding out that like you have to do the same amount of work for half as much money randomly. So like one week you show up and they're like, hey, we're cutting your pay by 50%. It's like, okay, well, I need to quit, right? But it's like, there's this is literally the only job that exists where you're doing this. Like, okay, what do I, how do I get out of this? Um, Harvick says he always gets notified. However, I have the bell ticked. Some people have the bell ticked and they still don't get notified. Or this has been proven they also distribute the notifications so what will happen is they'll go out over a couple of hours so my videos come out at 10 a.m. so people will get notifications the next day and so what that does is it throttles the video so the video is getting fewer views rather than it spiking up and and the algorithm seeing that it's that it's happening oh lots of people are watching this we should show it to more people because it's popular it's just like a trickle of views that add up to a thousand people over the course of several weeks. You know, like that's not so that it, it basically, this is hard to explain, but anytime you make a video, you're rolling the dice on viral content. Um, you don't know what's going to explode, but if, if there is no ability for the initial seed of people watching to grow, then it won't ever explode. So if you're cut off from the algorithm and subscribers don't know about it, you're also you're like double cut off. It's just never gonna. It's never gonna happen. And then somebody else picks it up. Like I said, you know, if uh, if you know Breitbart is talking about Bolshevik marketing, boom, I get like fifty thousand views, hundred thousand views, and that's great, and I appreciate it. But if they're not doing that, then like that content isn't shown to anyone, regardless of how cool it is and how much people like it. That's just how it is. Anyway, let's move on. Um, I don't have any access to Photoshop, but I do have GIMP. But that's fine. So um, I'm going to show you how to use another program called Inkscape. So I recommend Photoshop. Inkscape is another one. So Inkscape is actually a vector program like Adobe Illustrator, but way different <laughs> in terms of interface. But it's actually really good for designing book covers because it's very easy to do layout and it has a huge variety of text effects, including drop shadows, um, colors, things like that. I actually have designed several book covers in Inkscape. This one was originally designed in Inkscape because I didn't have Photoshop at the time. Um, and so I used GIMP to format the images and I used Inkscape to arrange them and do the text effects. And uh, Inkscape, I did the full wrap in Inkscape and it looks great. Um, it's a little bit slower working with it. Is this one the Inkscape one? All right, the original version of Water of Awakening was done in Inkscape. This is the original version of it with this cool foil text and everything. Um, this was all done in Inkscape um, because, and I had Photoshop at the time, but I was just really liked using Inkscape. I liked the workflow of it at the time, so I just did it. And then I actually redid it in Photoshop. I completely remade it. Um, and I actually think it looks better in, in the Photoshop version, even better, because I was able to really control the color space a little better. Uh, but it, the, the Inkscape version is really no, no slouch. It looks great. Um, the thing about Inkscape, though, is that you have way less blending effects compared to Photoshop. So if you're doing heavy compositing work, it's a lot more work to do it in Inkscape. But the design stuff, the text, author name, and whatever image you're going to use, boy, that's easy. And, and what was great is that I licensed a great image to use, so I really didn't have to worry about any kind of work doing a photo composite or anything like that. I just put the painting on it and then just put the text. It's super easy. That's another route that you can go. So you can use stock photos, you can photo composite, or you can just get a license, a piece of art that think you think works for the book and put it on there, put the text on it, and you're good to go. That The, the text and stuff, I'm surprised how often um, graphic designers drop the ball on text, not in terms of just knowing how the text is supposed to look for the genre. Uh, they don't they don't think 
Like they don't think about the fonts. It's weird. So sometimes like they come up with a cover design. They're like, this looks really good. I'm like, this isn't the right genre though. You know, this is a, this is a different genre than what you're trying to communicate here. <laughs> is it? Well, I like this font. It's like, yeah, but that's not, that's a font that tells me it's a detective novel. <laughs> not a, you know, like if you use courier or something, courier is like a font that you would only use on a horror novel or a detective novel. And you'd always use like a more debased version of it. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. So Inkscape's a good one. When they talk about authoritative sources, what they mean is authoritarian sources. I've, I've described in detail in the past how the news lies to you. Um, it uses really specific techniques to basically convince you that the opposite of the truth is true. They change the sequence of events. They use passive voice. They use all these little, all these little tricks to make you think things are different. Like the, the one that I really documented well was this guy who got beat up on this, um, <coughs> I think it was United Airlines in Chicago. And so everybody was like, United Airlines is this evil company. And it's like, <coughs> this guy refused to leave their property, which is their plane. And the police, the airport police, who actually were a very controversial group in Chicago, forcibly removed him and hurt him in the process. But nobody, nobody even mentioned that the police were the ones who did it. Uh, same thing with... Uh, you know, Covington Catholic, they show you part of the video and try to convince and just tell you, they prime you by telling you that there's a white, they're going to show you a white supremacist. And then it's just some kid in a MAGA hat smiling at a dude banging a drum in his face. And they're like, well, that's white supremacy. And you see the whole video and it's like, he just didn't do it. He just stood there. And then the media decided they were going to tar and feather him. Thinking Thursdays, does it mean thinking Thursdays are going to have to stop? I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to, which direction I'm going to go. If I'm just going to go like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I'm going to talk about whatever I want till I get banned. That might come a little bit later. Um, I don't know what I'll do. Um, YouTube loses a billion bucks a year. They don't care about profit. Absolutely, they do not. If BitChute was available on the Roku, I'd use it. I'm, I'm sure that there's actually a way to, to uh, hack your Roku and put, put unauthorized stuff on there. I've seen people take the stance of deleting videos after a time frame that they know will be problematic. Yeah, I've uh, most revenue's front-loaded, depending on how you do it, but a lot of revenue, it's over time. Like I still make a lot of money on videos I made like three years ago. It's like if you're making, if it's consistently viewed because it's really queued into search results, so you make like five bucks a month off of it, off of a bunch of videos, it adds up to a whole bunch of money. Right, so you don't want to you don't want to delete old videos that people still watch. You can delete old videos that are problematic that no one watches, absolutely, or put them on private mode. You know that that is something to do, and that is something I've done a little bit of, but it hasn't it hasn't stopped the bleeding. <laughs> Kyle says, "Use Sargon, Tim Pool, and Jimmy Eichen are my go-to." Thank you. I heard about an author, John David Ebert, whose publishing rights were sold to the publisher to an, another and they won't even sell the rights back to him. Yeah, that happens. And uh, according to contract, it has to be out of print for like a certain number of years, like seven years before you can get the rights back. And in that time, you can't make any money off of it. So you get kind of put in a crappy spot sometimes. Um, I think Dan Simmons is getting crapped on right now because he mentioned that this um, Swedish child abuse victim that was being put on TV to scream about the environment. That is child abuse, by the way. I would never expose an autistic child to that level of media exposure. Um, it's purely for money and for uh, the titillation of the parents, and it does amount to child abuse. Um, poor Greta. So you mentioned that this is a child who doesn't know what the hell she's talking about, which is absolutely true. And if you mention she's a, she, you're just a perpetuating child abuse, which is also true, you're going to get crapped on. Um, so Dan Simmons, who wrote Hyperion, <laughs> you know, he came out now he's, he's, he's unpersoned. So, you know, you, if you're, if you're with, this is, who's this? This is Signet Bantam Spectra. I'm trying to remember who that is. And I think that's an imprint of someone else. Um, you know, if they decide to stop publishing his books, yeah, Bantam, it's a Bantam imprint. Um, you know, if they decide to stop publishing his books, he's got to wait like seven years to self-publish them, <laughs> right? Uh, or, or however long he's in the contract, it has to be out of print. Even though it's a super popular book, it's one of the most popular science fiction series is, is this Hyperion. And it's great. It's a really good series. I'll talk about it in the future at some point. Um, what are you going to do? 
Uh, Orson Scott Card, he can't publish anymore. He's blacklisted. He can't publish a book. Do you think that part of the reason for the viewer drop-off is that some people who got interested in you do the Star Wars content might have left once you produce less of it? Yes, but but the thing is, is that that already happened, right? So I stopped talking about Star Wars for a while, and then like views were really stable. And then they went 80% off of that, you know? So it could be that. I'm not interested in talking about Star Wars nonstop. I, uh, in fact, I get annoyed that there's channels that, that just started doing that. Um, like... Everything I have to say about a particular movie, I say, and then I move on. Like, why do I need to keep talking about Star Wars? I might make a video this week, like, on, I guess, they came out with another, like, preview of the new Star Wars movie. It's just going to make me more angry. So I'll watch it and make a video be like, this makes me more angry, and I still don't care about it. And people will sympathize and watch the video and click on it. You know, that's how it works. So that's part of it. That's definitely part of it, Hardwick. You're correct. <laughs> Uh, Mike Browning says, um, I waited until 9.05 to see if I would get a notification that you'd started a live stream at 9. Nothing. I've been with you a while. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. I appreciate that. But it's true. Um, you know, no one gets no one gets notified. Uh, like right now, you know, I like to wait a while. There's 43. Now we're, now we're at enough people. Like we have a nice packed room, which is good. So we'll, we'll start doing some of the design stuff. Uh, let's see here. I've been looking at websites like Pixels and Unsplash that offer royalty photos for free. Have you ever used any of those? I haven't, but you know, if if your budget needs to be zero, you can make it work. Um, it's possible to make it work. You just have to you have to work harder on finding the right photos. I find it that uh, revealing who is speaking in the dialogue until the end is very distracting and confusing. Is it bad to begin a section of dialogue with identifying the character first? Not always. You know, you could say Mike said and then do that. But I, I like to switch it up a little bit. And then once, if it's just two characters talking, you can just leave the said part out of it for most of it. I'd watch your content if you have to order VHS. Thank you, I appreciate that. What would some good words be for titles in the steampunk genre? So steam, obviously. Brass is a really good one. Uh, so steam, brass, um, Steel, I think, is a good one. Um, yeah, those those that kind of pop, kind of cue into it. <gasps> clockwork, that's really clock punk, but you, it also works for steampunk. Like Clockwork Angel, which is a it's a Rush album, but you know, it could totally be like steampunk. When I hear that, I'm like, oh, it sounds like a steampunk novel. There is a thing called clockpunk, which is just steampunk, but say Baroque, uh, early Baroque or late Renaissance instead. Yeah. So you know, any of those are good. I like brass and steam or uh, there's probably some others I'm not thinking of. Air, you know, if you can do something like airships or, you know, something like that. So like uh, John De La Rose did for Steam and Country. So, you know, for King and Country, we're going to replace King with Steam. Bam. Bestseller, right? <laughs> so it's a great it's a great way to cue into the genre immediately. And then you put a really pretty cover on the uh, girl on the cover with goggles and it's like steampunk. It's really easy. Um uh, when you when you just go heavy. So a lot of times people get held up on titling their book or marketing their book or designing a book cover because they don't want it to be too cheesy. And the thing is, it's not. It's good to be cheesy in a lot of cases because you want to be really upfront with the reader what they can expect. And in some cases, the the harder you hit the genre, if you're trying to hit a certain genre really hard, the harder you hit it as far as keying into the audience exactly what to expect, the better off it's going to do. So if you name it for Steam and Country, you put a pretty girl on the cover, put goggles and like a top hat, then it's going to sell. If you're thinking, um, let's say you're going to do horror, right? Like Voices of the Void sounds like eldritch horror, and it is, you know, and then there's like a screaming guy on it and tentacles, right? So you, you just, you got to cue into it hard uh, on the cover, and that's that's probably a better idea. So people, a lot of authors are like, oh, it's cheesy. You want to be cheesy because it, it lets people know what's up. Um, have you guys seen the new Dragon Force? album cover it's the best 
I, I rate it Dragon Force out of 10. It's the most Dragon Force thing I've ever seen. I might go grab it from the other room and show it to you guys. Um, but it's it's a perfect example of just going full bore. Whatever you're trying to sell, you just do that to the absolute maximum. And you just can't look at the cover and imagine anything besides the music that ends up coming out of it. It's great. In your video today, you said that Dan Simmons has been unpersoned. I hadn't heard of this. What's the outrage about? Yeah, I already talked about that. Sorry, I already addressed that. Let's keep going on. <laughs> um, feel like I'm going to have to create a Twitter account. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at David V. Stewart. Came to a channel because of Star Wars, but stayed. Thank you. What do we, what we really need is a new mainstream platform. It's dedicated to free speech over political bias. The problem with free speech is it's it's a self destroying concept. Like Gab, Gab has. If you watch the history of Gab, um, and and I just mean when I say free, I mean unrestricted. The problem with YouTube to me is not that the speech is so restricted; it's that they are not transparent with what the rules are. And I think there's a European Union um, labor union that is suing YouTube to basically uncover the algorithm, because what happens is that you make a video. And it gets demonetized and you don't know why. And they're like, if we tell people, then we'll have bad actors exploiting it. It's like, how is having a specific set of rules exploitive? If they say, you can't talk about this, we don't. here's the subjects you're not allowed to address. Now, I could say, well, I, I mean, this is pretty locked down. This isn't free speech. But at least it's up front and I can choose or choose not to talk about them. I can make that choice for myself rather than... Let me make a piece of content that I hope is popular and I hope I also will get me paid. And it may not. Either one, you know. It makes it twice as hard to, to make any money on the platform. But with Gab, like people people hop on the platform and start spamming child porn at other people um, or just at each other to get Gab, uh, you know, de-hosted, for example. So if you have completely unrestricted anything, as soon as you start acting, adding restrictions, you start imposing on this idea of free speech. But if it's completely unrestricted, then the site will get taken down for like violating the law and things like that. There's limits to what you can you can do. Like what I would rather have is a is is a social media site that's just really upfront with what the rules are. Here's the here's the words you cannot say. If they were just upfront with that, it'd be way better. You know. You could also create an email mailing list that'll immediately notify anyone who subscribes to it when you upload a new video. I don't want to spam people. So what I probably do instead, and I'm going to do this from now on, um, is I'll probably have a once a week on my regular mailing list. Here's all the videos for the week. Watch the ones you like. And and that'll be just as good, you know, um, versus just kind of spamming people out. People will just unsubscribe. Any luck viewing Barton Fink? Uh, no. Oh yeah, St Clockwork Angels is a steampunk album uh, concept. There also it was a novel. Um, who wrote the novel? Kevin J. Anderson wrote the novel with uh, Neil Peart. So I haven't read the novel because I don't like Kevin J. Anderson's writing that much. But I might read it at some point. Yeah, totally. Um, Airship of the Brass Order, perfect series title for steampunk. That's it. Airship of the Brass Order. Or you could just call it uh, His Majesty's, His Majesty's, uh, you know, in service, His Majesty's Air Service. And it's like got a big blimp on the cover or something with steam everywhere. Totally get it. The Eternal Cogs. Hey, David, um, beginning my journey in flamenco, thanks to you. Any songs you recommend to get trained in Rosciatos and finger technique? So when you're learning flamenco, um, there's two approaches. One is to learn learn compass the entire time and that's what most teachers do uh if you look at juan serrano's books who's my teacher he has complete pieces even in the early books so if you look at the flamenco guitar basic techniques the famous yellow book uh there's complete pieces and you can just learn those pieces they're great songs and they're completely authentic um they have the compass in them i also recommend say systematic studies to really learn compass playing if you're not playing with dancers you don't need to worry about that that much um you kind of want to focus on getting the whole thing including uh falsetta and compass um 
and then from there you can go to more advanced complete pieces pieces by say the you know by Juan Serrano or Juan Martin or Paco de Lucia any of the solo pieces for the most part a lot of the bigger solo or a lot of bigger flamenco guys like Paco de Lucia or you know anyone else uh, they play with a group so it doesn't translate that well to solo solo guitar but Juan stuff starts a solo guitar and it's much easier to have all the complicated crap that Juan Serrano does and just kind of cut stuff out of it to make it work in an ensemble than to go the other way anyway so hopefully that helps you <laughs> Hardwick says I should be a contributor at Bleeding Fool and post your videos there now the thing is that's not a bad idea and I'm not gonna not gonna reject that but that doesn't that just kind of shunts the problem the the deeper problem is that the extreme growth that is i mean that you're just you're relying on an already previously established audience you can only grow according to how much bleeding fools audience is and bleeding fools fine I'm not saying anything bad about them but it's not a long-term solution it's just another thing to do right and there's nothing nothing wrong with that right um but for me you know the ultimate problem is I'm just I'm shut out of the I'm shut out of the system right now. I'm blacklisted. So a little bit disheartening, but it's okay. We'll figure it out. <laughs> sorry. Sorry my nose is so so stuffy. Anyway, let's let's design a cover. So um, what kind of genres are you guys looking at doing today? Um, I did a little poll last week and it looked like fantasy and sci-fi were coming up a whole lot. So um, just tell me in chat if there's anybody who's doing maybe young adult fantasy or somebody who's doing somebody doing steampunk we could probably do we could try a ste i've never done a steampunk cover but we could probably do one real quick um just to get the idea of what's of what's up with steampunk um may have to i may have to go like find a font but that that might be an opportunity to really show you guys some cool stuff so um anyone doing steampunk Someone, someone asked about that. Well, maybe we'll do steampunk. I've never done it. <laughs> if you're a casual guitarist, what recommendations do you have to become more rounded and technically skilled? Specific books. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would just say learn learn the pieces you want to play, and that's going to grow, make you grow. I, I'm not into uh, I'm not into books. I know that sounds weird, but. You know, method books are good when you're, you know, you could look at the Christopher Parkin in Classical Guitar Method. It's a great book to learn the right hand. It's a great book to learn the right hand. Absolutely the best, in my opinion. Um, even better than most other techniques that maybe have flamenco or whatever in them. But um, use that to learn the technique and just to have stuff to practice. But other than that, you know, learn the pieces. If you want to, if you want to play Dust in the Wind, just go pull up the tabs and figure out how to play it and that's how you're going to get better at it Terra Parr's doing young adult fantasy space opera space opera is a good one what's the best way to make scenes flow smoothly especially if they change locations I don't bother making them flow smoothly as soon as the last piece of dialogue happens I put an asterisk and just jump to the next scene like it's a screenplay so I just do it like a screenplay and that works for me. It's more efficient. It cuts out a whole bunch of prose where you have to try to fill in a gap with prose. I don't like doing that that much. Sometimes I do it if I feel like I really need to fill in some travel space. Otherwise, you just jump to the next location and the audience figures out what's happening. So I just put an asterisk and jump to the next scene. Why not keep uh, keep it rolling with the steampunk theme for the cover? That's kind of halfway between fantasy and sci-fi. <laughs> Okay. I'm suffering from dyslexia, but I'm writing on my first book like I'm a gardener. I really struggle with the two. Um, you know, if you have dyslexia, you might try dictation software, like Dragon, because um, that will get you unfocused on the, the words as they're appearing on the screen and just focus on how it sounds. Um, and people who think dictation software is bad, Homer was blind. He had to dictate his poems. The, the Odyssey is dictated. <laughs> the Iliad and the Odyssey are dictated, guys. It's okay to use dictation software. Um, I 
I'm doing an eldritch horror novel with evil mermaids set in the sea in the 19th century. The main character is a young sailor in training. Now, there, that could be an interesting one. Um, cyberpunk. Noir mystery horror. Uh... Let's see what let's see what we can do with steampunk. So um, I think I'm going to do Photoshop today. Uh, let me let me show you what I'm going to do first. For um, or maybe we can do Inkscape. What do you guys want to do? You guys want to do Photoshop or do you want to do the free program Inkscape today? Here's what I'm going to start with. I'll uh, I'll set this up for you guys. Let's get this down here. This kind of adjusted. Um, okay, I'm going to use Adobe Stock. You can use Shutterstock or where, if you're a graphic designer, whatever you want. Um, and just help, hop over here. Watch this. Girl with goggles. We'll just like maybe do like a version of John's cover. We'll see if there's any, any girl like wearing goggles, like steampunk goggles. You never know. Like people put up all kinds of crazy photos here. This is girl with glasses, which is not what we want. Um, let's do uh, Victorian woman. See here, here's what you want. You want, okay. So he, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop, I'm gonna pop a fast one on you guys. So I, I see a picture right here. Let's look at this picture. You guys can see this, right? So this picture right here could just be a book cover by itself. It has the central element, humanizing element, so human for the central element, which is a good central element. Uh, you have a lamp and then you have scenery. So you already have auxiliary elements in here. You wouldn't have to do anything with this. You could just take this and put text on it and you have a book cover. You do a couple effects. And if you look at more from this series, you can see that there's, uh, there's a couple others that are just great. You know, someone already did a bunch of Photoshop work on this one. I wouldn't use this as it was, but I, I might use one of the other ones. I like the ones from behind. So let, let's talk about this real quick. So I like for young adult, I notice a lot of people do this shot from behind and they do this shot from behind for some interesting reasons. First of all, we see that it's a human. We see that it's a woman that's appealing to a certain demographic. We see the lamp, which kind of lets us know it takes place in the past. But we don't see her face. And so this kind of allows for somebody to project themselves onto the face. This is also a really good one because their faces are obscured. The problem with this photo for using it for what I'm imagining is that there's not enough room for the text. So I would actually take this, cut the background out and put a new background behind them. Like I like the girls, I'd cut the girls out and then put a whole new composite background of what I wanted to show. And then that would be my fantasy book cover, my young adult fantasy book cover. So let's see, let's check chat. Anyone have, um, yeah, so a young adult fantasy is the main character of a female or a male. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna save this to, a library here. I was uh, saved to the wrong one. Let's create a new one called uh, Cover Design Live, rather than Memeage. I have I have a folder that's just called Memeage. It's just for me to make memes, <laughs> which I put out on Twitter sometimes. I'm weird. I'm a weird dude. Um, if you darken that one, it would also work for horror. I like the girls. <laughs> Hey, if you put a pretty girl on the cover, people are going to click, man. Uh, if you have a question about a, a trope in your novel, uh, either PM me on Twitter or email me. Probably Twitter's faster because I have uh, Twitter on my phone. Oh, my. Oh, my. This is one that you you really couldn't use. Demonetized <laughs> for nudity. Oh, oh, here's a great one, too. So... If you're doing like gothic horror or gothic, like a gothic story, this this could just be book covered. So let's let me show you this one. I'm gonna I'm gonna save this one to the library. Um, 
I could probably just license this one and, and use it as a pre-made. Let me just show this one to you real quick because I have an idea for this one. So um, I'm gonna license it and then uh, I'll, I'll do it in Inkscape. I'll show this to you in Inkscape. Okay, so here's Inkscape. Uh, 0.91, I don't know if they have a newer version. I don't think it's at version 1.0 yet. But let's uh, let's play. There we go. So hopefully you can see all the all the stuff here. All right. So here is our page. Uh, now first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to set up the uh, document property. So when you're designing a book cover, first thing you want to do is actually make sure you have the right measurements. You don't want to just use default because this is eight and a half by eleven or so. Actually, it's some weird other one. I think A4 is what they to do anyway we're gonna do um, 8 by 5 and that's because for the the right stream I've been doing 8 by 5 6 by 9 or 8 by 5 are the two main sizes you want to look at 8 by 5 is this 6 by 9 is this um, now I like that is in here a magic card I found a magic card guys which one is it zombie infestation There it goes. Zombie infestation. All right. Um, eight by five is better for a short book. Six by nine is better for anything that's long. You want to have fewer pages rather than more. Eight by five is a little taller. So let's zoom in a little bit. First thing we do after we set up our document is we're going to drag off some um, guidelines. All you have to do is click on this ruler at the top or the sides and drag to where you want the guideline to be. This is important because in Inkscape, you won't see the edges of your document when you're working uh, when you have images that go outside the area of the document. So you need those guidelines. In Photoshop, you don't need to do this uh, because it automatically masks it. That's the default mode um, is for it to, to mask it. And it's pretty easy to do. Okay. I just dragged it in. There we go. Uh, and actually, before I go any further, let's go to layers. I'm going to set up some layers here. Um, we're going to do like the, uh, the art and... I'm gonna do um, overlays. I'll show you what to do with overlays. Um, maybe text. So the text will be on the very top. Um, now for this, I kinda wanna move this into, oops. Oops, there we go. There we go, all right. So uh, it's on layer one, whatever. And so you can hide it or show it, kind of like with Photoshop, it works pretty well. So I like this image because it has the auxiliary elements that we really want. Uh, hold control and you can, you can get it just the right size. It has a forest, it has a girl, and it's got lots of space for text that we can, that we can work with. Uh, so it's gonna be perfect for what we wanna do. Now, when you turn this into a paperback book cover, this will actually be covered up with bleed. So we're gonna leave purposefully a little bit of space on the edges for when we actually uh, actually do this as a paperback book cover. Oh, super chat. Thank you, Dylan. I've been watching your channel for quite a while, but this is the first time I've been able to hop on a live stream. Glad to have you. Just wanted to let you know I appreciate all your content. Thanks and keep up the great work. Thank you, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Can you take a look at my first book's cover? It's already published. Yes, but you'll have to send me a link somewhere um, you could link it in chat I'll I, it just won't show up till I approve it all right so now that we have the image um, the next thing we want to think about is color grading and things like this color grading is way easier in Photoshop it's just much easier however um, if we go to the overlays layer and um, we decide we're going to use that one we can actually draw some color overlays. So this is a really cheap and easy way to do it. Let's say we don't like this color and we really want something that is very, maybe, you know, more pink. We're just going to, to cover it up with a square. And uh, we're gonna go to fill and stroke. And for the fill part, we can make it um, however we want it to look. Uh, so let's say we want it to be kind of a green color. Um, we're actually gonna turn down the alpha channel, which is the transparency. 
and um, turn down the lightness a little bit and turn up the saturation. You can make it red. You can make it more green, like whatever color you want it to be. And you can even make it, say, a radial, radial vignette. Um, this is good to make it a little bit more subtle. So what we'll do here is we click the center one. It'll show us a color. Maybe we want that color to be pretty clear. Uh, I want it to be maybe super saturated, but just very transparent like that. Then we can click the outside one. We can make that one uh, dark and like fully saturated and you end up kind of with this green color. And then from there you can really play with the transparency to get it uh, to get it really right. So let's make this part very transparent like that. And we may make this part like much more black and uh, maybe less saturated and also more transparent. And then all of a sudden you end up with this green color when green, green communicates something a little bit different than yellow. So if I go back and um, go back to layers and I, I hide the overlay layer, you'll see that we just are adding in a different color. And what we can even do from the overlays is we can go to filters, color, and we can even do some crazier color, right? We can do like a color shift where we are, this is, you know, a uh, live preview. We can just kind of shift all the colors around as much as we want. Like maybe we want it to be kind of purple. You can just try different colors right here. And more red. This is really sepia toned. Sepia tone is going to feel like something very in the past, very like 19th century. Let's do something like that, and you can actually crank up the saturation like that. And then, and then um, from there, you can turn down the blending so you can get more or less of the color if you want. Um, so, so those are a couple ways that you can actually alter the colors um, of what's here. I kind of like the colors that are here, though. So let's say we're, we're going to go with those colors. And um, what we're going to do from here is we're just going to add some text. So let's go up to the text layer. Let me check the the, uh, the chat. Thank you for the super chat, Rand. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, because this kind of reminds me of like a young adult dark fantasy kind of thing, um, I'm going to go ahead and add some basic text uh, down here. So uh, you can put the title either at the top or the bottom, depending on what you want. But you usually want them separated. You can put them both in the same place. Um, but let's go ahead and let's let's just put something up there and, and um, we'll call it title and uh, kind of make that bigger. And from here we get to choose a font. I'm going to go to text and font. And for this I'm going to go with uh, a font called Fog Lighten. You're going to see this all over Amazon if you look, if you look careful here. Fog lighten number four, there it is. So, um, and we can actually do the title a couple different ways. So let's say that the, if we come up with a title that's really forgotten. Hopefully I'm, I spelled forgotten correctly and I'm not embarrassing myself. Um, so now we have a title. Now black looks okay here, but black is really not ideal for what we what we wanna do. So we're gonna, we're gonna mess with that a little bit. At the bottom of Inkscape, there's a whole bunch of different color choices, and you can actually just try out a, a bunch of base colors that you might want, do grays or reds. Um, you can even start with some of these really bright colors to kind of see what you maybe want. Um, but one of the things that you may wanna do, like yellow is gonna have a high contrast with blue, but blue is gonna look very weird right now because we haven't done any work with it. So we can, Probably, maybe let's do, just do white for now, and then we're gonna add some basic text effects. So one of the things you can do here is you can go to fill and stroke, and you can add a stroke to this. So stroke paint, you can add a stroke and decide on the color. That's gonna be an outline. Um, you can change the stroke style here. We're not gonna worry about that. You can create a gradient style stroke. Um, but for fill, let's go ahead and let's do a linear gradient. And so what we've got here is we've got a, a gradient that goes all the way across. If you go all the way on the left-hand side, hopefully you can see this one. Um, there's a tool here that looks like, you know, two dots connected by a line segment. 
We're going to click that. That's the grading tool. And what you see here is we've got a bunch of different um, stops. So one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a stop in the middle by double clicking. And um, I'm going to add a stop here and a stop about there. And from here, we can actually do a lot of different things. So um, one of the things we'll see with this is the opacity is at 0%. We'll just turn that up. And one of the things we could do right here is make this opacity zero. So the forgotten gets kind of goes to zero in the middle. And we can do the opacity here is quite quite bright. And let's add another stop here that's got a lower, lower opacity level. And uh, this stop will make lower. And we'll do one here that's a little higher. Okay. So you see like it's going kind of in and out. Thing is, this um, this will kind of disappear on the page. So we can add a couple of different options. We can we can put in a stroke um, stroke paint here. Oh, we don't want to, to stroke the gradient. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. So we're gonna just click the, the text and we can add a stroke to it. And decide on a color. Um, maybe you want a yellow or something kind of sepia toned like this. And so you can create a text that kind of just goes with the background, kind of blends into it. Or you can do something that's that's dark and bright. And we can always uh, turn down the opacity of the stroke like this. And we can also should be able to change the heaviness of the stroke over here uh, it's to make it really thin like that. So we kind of see it like that. Now we can do some other text effects once we have it here. Let's go to filters. We're going to go to shadows and glows and we're going to go to drop shadow. Now I'm going to bring this dialog box right here so you can see what's happening. You want to click that live preview box. And from here you can do a lot of things. Um, if we go to horizontal offset of zero and zero, this is how far off of the words you're going to create it. And from here, we can make the blur radius like zero. And so you can see as I add a drop shadow, you can see it moving behind. And you can kind of move it around. See? See that? So a really good basic drop shadow is to start with zero and actually to turn the blur radius up quite a bit. So it creates just this kind of a fog behind it, as you can see. And there's different kinds of sh shading you can do. So we're going to do a little bit of a fog behind it. And the blur color, we can we can really turn the turn this up on. And we can even make it a color if you want to. Unfortunately, because of this program, you can't do things like color burn, any of the really crazy blending effects you're not going to be able to do. But you can do some really basic ones that, um, that will work for this kind of genre. And I can hit apply. And you notice I hit live preview again. I can create an even an even uh, broader shadow on top. And you can actually just kind of use this to darken or lighten what's there. Um, and we can, you know, let's create one that's just a little bit offset here. Let's just go. We'll go turn this blur radius pretty far down and we'll just kind of go maybe one and 0.5. That's a little too much. Eight. And then we'll just turn the blur radius up till it's not obvious that it's just like a second shadow. See that? Now we have a kind of an interesting effect. And I'm probably going to redo that gradient on there too. Um, so, but you see it's kind of popping out now. The whole idea is to try to make this kind of clear. But I, I'm thinking I want some different colors here. So I might I might uh, go back to this. Let's hit the gradient tool and you're going to see the stops. And from here, let's come up with, uh, we're going to go to fill and stroke, uh, fill. And start turning up the transparency. And we can just come up with a color uh, that's maybe somewhere in blue. Or purple, maybe, or pink. Nah, pink is too far out. Let's do a light blue. 
and uh, I kind of like that. So that's the color I'm going to go with for this. And uh, and that's going to really kind of pop out. For this one, same thing, both blue. And you guys should do a couple different colors of blue, as you guys can see. And I'm probably going to turn this, this transparency up a little bit more. Turn this one up to 100, maybe darken it just a bit. Uh, this one is zero, which I like. This we can go slightly lighter. A little bit different color blue, pretty high on the opacity. Let's change that blur percentage. It's a little too bright, a little too bright. There we go. Um, so I'm going to slide it back towards the blue. There we go. Let's make this closer to 100. A little more saturated. And this one, turn it up. And then over here, let's make it kind of more purpley, more violet. Uh, and then we have kind of a effect there so this is something you can do I might play around with this I, I it would be something that I probably like spend a bunch of hours just like getting perfect uh, but you can see like there's a there's a there's a text there I'm, I probably actually of undo what I just did and just say like oh I did that clear color thing to get to where I'm going uh, you know and just go there and then you're gonna have an author name down here which is gonna be you know you know, Sandra H. Smith, let's say. I'm just gonna make up a, make one up. Make that white. And we're gonna choose a font which really communicates this. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, author of Ghost Blanket, I don't know. Uh, now let's pick some some fonts for these. Again, hold Control, and you won't. Uh, you don't ever want to stretch. You always want it to be as the as the person designed it. Um, let's see here. Let's pick a font for this. So this is where the design really comes through. Comes through, um, and this could actually be like a totally good enough cover. I'm gonna add some more stuff to it that I'm gonna show you though. Uh, let's see here, Gutenberg, no, Garamond. Yeah, Garamond is probably like a good choice because it's really simple. But we're gonna pick one that's a little more gothic in its look, and that's gonna be something like no, no, no. Not Blackwood Castle, that is way cheesy. I might have to actually go into like my font program to find one. So I use a font program called Nexus Font to just kind of keep track of my ridiculous, uh, here we go, serif. I, want a, I know I want a serif font for this. I'm not seeing the ones I want, stylish headline. Probably not going to be. It's like a default. Nope. Fantasy. It's probably not going to be under this collection. We're going to type in Sandra. Let's go to all of them. I only have a thousand fonts installed, guys. I'm keeping it, keeping it kind of limited here. See if I can find one that's good. Uh, no, I don't like it. Chat book. Chapic's what I like. Let's use that. We could actually turn on some music. Let's do this with some music. 
Am I watching Joker this week? There's no way I'm going to be able to go to the movies this week. I Okay. Hey, anyone in the Central Valley, I might go see Dragon Force on Friday if you guys want to come see Dragon Force with me. Just might. I don't know for sure because I need to get my brother-in-law to come with me. So Dragon Force is like our favorite band. Author of Ghost Farm. And so we're just going to shrink that down a little bit. And I'm going to put that one in, say, it's a good one. Century Gothic. Uh, maybe the same one, chat book. Now, one thing already that I'm looking at with the composition here is that there's a little too much space on the bottom. So one of the things I'm going to do is just pull the image open. Just open it up a bit. Central figure is going to be a little bit more featured. There we go. It's perfect. So this is this is going to be fine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess with this um, gradient again, and I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to get rid of the transparency. I don't like it. I decided. Um, I still like the idea of a gradient, but I'm just not liking how it looks like this. I think having it be, you know, opaque. Is what we really want. Let's, show this. Let's delete some of these nodes. Better that way. It has transparency on it anyway. I'm wondering if I did. Oh, yeah, opacity. Crank up that up. There we go. There's nice and bright. It's from there. Let's remove the filters. We'll redo the filters. So this is a good starting place for this. Um, now let's redo it with that uh, linear. Yeah, this looks a lot better now. No wonder. No wonder it wasn't looking like I wanted it to look. I'm gonna have the put a stop in the middle that's just kind of slightly transparent. I'm gonna crank this one up. Um, I'm gonna change this to a little bit darker blue. This one over to a more almost violet, like this. This one can be no, on the lighter side. I'm just gonna I have it like that. So again, if we do have it kind of fading in the middle, but you can see it's it's nice and bright and dark on the outside. And if we look at that from from far out, it actually looks pretty decent. Um, with this font. Um, am I misspelling forgotten? Let's check it. No. Okay. I was... <laughs> um, yeah, Dragon Force will be out in the Midwest at some point. What about moving uh, the right side of forgotten in a curve down? Is that possible? Desirable? I wouldn't do it. I'd keep it simple, personally. I think this works good. And then from here, um, I'm actually, I think I'm gonna pop off the stroke for a minute. And then um, we'll add some uh, some drop shadows right here. So live preview, you can see this is gonna make it pop out quite a bit. Um, for this one, I'm just gonna dial it back into zero and just have it be as a, as a blur behind it, you can see. Uh, and we can actually make the blur color anything other than black as well. Um, you can make it slightly transparent or lots of different options. So if we wanted like a, an, a really orange one, we could actually do something like very orange like that. And, and that's that's gonna have like a certain effect that I think is actually pretty cool. Like kind of this red color. I think this, this might actually look pretty good. And we can just turn that blur radius up a bit like that. 
All right, so that's that's going to be our first one. And we're going to preview another one, but we're going to turn it back to black. And we're going to offset just a little bit. So I like to do a couple that are kind of offset, as you can see, a little bit less blur. And if you do good drop shadows, you don't really need to do like the stroke or anything. Okay, so that's definitely like, definitely pops out more. I'm, I'm actually gonna do a really broad one. Um, another drop shadow, and this one's gonna be like just really like that, see? So we get a, like a really big kind of blur behind it, and then we can actually make that blur color something kind of purpley. It might actually look kind of cool. You can also try different effects. Like there's obviously this would get rid of the letters and just show you the shadow. But we kind of want this. Um, it's a little too purple. Let's go, let's go over this way a bit. Let's see it like that. All right, now that I have this, I'm actually going to change the change the font color again. Uh, because I think it's slightly too dark. I'm gonna make it really a lot brighter here. Make the edges brighter here. Make this kind of in this area. A little more alpha. Full alpha. There we go. For this one, I think I'm, I think I'm just gonna get rid of that transparency. It's not doing what I want it to do. And then here we'll slide it a little bit. Make it really light. Like that. And then we'll keep that one dark. Okay. All right. So I, I think that looks good. If I spend more time on it, I'm basically gonna be wasting wasting time. All right. So there's there's our design, guys. Uh, really, really basic. Now I'm gonna add some some drop shadows to this. Um, really. Just a black one and we might have to just zoom in a little bit here this is just to make sure that these things pop out it's actually really not necessary but I'm just gonna add it just in case very very subtle effect and we can actually do even crazier filters on this one. You know, there's all these different filters, you know. Uh, you know, you could make it look like wacky stuff on here. There's tons of filters. So you, know, you could do like a grain. It doesn't look that great when you just do it like that. You know, canvas. That really work. Oh yeah, there's different kinds of bevels you can do. Most of these don't really work. Don't really work that well. So I don't usually recommend them. Uh, but that's that's as much as you need for now. Now we need to actually add, if we go back to layers, we really need to to add a vignette to this to really darken the edges. And there's two ways you can do this. You can make your own, or you can, you can just download one. So let's just download one, because that's easy. We'll go to uh, vignette transparent, and you can just click images, and you'll probably just find one. Here, there's one that you can use. Someone made in Photoshop. You find some different ones. Maybe there's, you know, here's a good one that has like some cracked edges. There's a blood vignette, which you can also play the color with if you want. You can color shift it. Let's see if there's a 
if I cracked, you know, you can get something kind of cool like this. This adds a little grit to what you're doing. Some of these you may have to pay for because they're, they're actual assets. Um, I think I have one. I think I have a couple that are just saved that we can just use. So anyway, you can spend some time searching and find one that you think is really cool. Use it. There's a lot of them that people just make. They're just put out. You can also make your own. So I really, I don't feel too bad about like not using someone's vignette. Just copy. This is a really small one. You can see. Pretty small one. And let me um, see if I can. I think I have one in. Let me see here. Yeah, I have a couple of vignettes I've saved, so let me just use one. Just pop it out here. Here it is. Oops. Make that visible. Oh, it didn't show up. Oh, I might have done too much blur on this. Because watch, if I if I hide the uh, art, you can see the edges. So I probably did too much blur. Um, there's a way you can get around this by drawing a much bigger text box. Uh, so that's one way that you can do this. Um, and I don't remember how to make the text box bigger because I never used this program. So I'm not sure how exactly you do that. But you can see if I do that, it just makes it stretched. So we don't want to use that. I'll probably redo that in a minute. There it is, overlays. Let's delete this this blue one we did. I'm just gonna use this one. Um, they just have a move 90 degrees. Oh, here it is. Boop, there we go. And this one, you just wanna stretch it to fit. Doesn't matter. There you go. Put the, the art on it, and then of course from here you can you can turn the overlay up or down. I think it looks good, kind of full on. And there, now that's a really simple gothic book cover, or like young adult fantasy book cover. I think this song started over. Yeah, let's pause the song. Okay, should have gone to the next song. All right, so there you go. There's a really, really simple book cover. I actually licensed this image, so I can actually just use this as a book cover or like make it in Photoshop even better than it is. But I probably wouldn't do the design any different than how I did it. Uh, the design looks fine. So this is one of the cheapest ways that you can make a book cover. Um, all it involves is finding an image, one image that you wanna use that contains both the auxiliary elements that you want for your story as well as the central element. So if this was a ghost story that had trees in it somewhere and featured a young woman as the protagonist, I would use this. Um, now we can also do some further color grading here. So um, I'm gonna go back to the art layer and I'm actually gonna go to color and um, you know, we can do a bunch of different things. For now, let's color shift it. And we can see we can make this green. Um, I might make it almost blue. I see it. Blue says way more like ghosty stuff. So let's push it into the blue, like slightly blue, like this. If it's green, it's gonna feel more fantasy. If you go blue, now you're in the air. Now, now you're in. Now you're in young adult land. Okay, and then from here, go to filters, color. We're gonna go to lightness, contrast, and uh, let's make it really pop here. Just kind of turn the contrast up a bit. See. Now we're getting. Now you notice how much better it starts to look once we just start tweaking with the, the pictures a little bit. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna change the color here. Again, let's go to fill and stroke. 
a solid color and uh, make it uh, make it like a, a violet. Now we're kind of in young adult territory. I think. What do you guys think? I think it's slightly like that. And actually, I'm going to go with that. And then from here, we can once again adjust our stops. So we have full alpha here. Well, kind of full alpha here. And I want this middle one to be kind of white. And then the edges can be. And you can actually change this. You know, you can make it like this. So it has just a little bit of different angle to it. And we can make that just like slightly darker, make that, you know, a little bit more kind of on the blue side. This one maybe a little bit more shifted blue. This one a little bit lighter. And of course full 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 opacity. And full opacity on that one. Yeah. You should turn the opacity down a little bit. There you go. So there, now we have a really interesting um, design. You can also add things like fog effects to this and they wouldn't be out of place. Um, so, you know, this is just a really simple, easy design. Notice that I darkened everything and, and kind of upped the contrast quite a bit. Um, that's just, it's gonna be a good idea to do that. So now we're at, now we actually have a good design here. You can actually, and you see you have negative space over here. You could put like a little tagline here that's like, um, this makes me think of like a ghost story. You know, all she wanted was to be to remember. You know, you could do a little tagline if you wanted to. I think that's kind of dumb though, so I'm gonna leave it all. All right, there you go. Now we've got a. Now we have a design. Okay. So that took about 30 minutes, and I've never done this genre before. But I think that this would actually be like a a good enough cover to to rock and roll in this genre. Um, there's like more that you can always do. You know, there's always a little bit more you can do uh, to kind of pop things up and make them really, you know, make them really stand out. Um, one thing that I would do in Photoshop, so if I were to do this in Photoshop, I would just, uh, I, I would make her a different color. But you don't have to do this. This is probably good enough. So this would be a way to make this good enough. Um, if you want, let me, let me do that in Photoshop real quick and, um, and I'll show you. Since we already have the design down, we'll just remake it in Photoshop real quick so you can see. Uh, just one extra element I would probably do. Um, so to do this in Photoshop, create new, um, 5x8, 300 DPI, that's perfect. Um, let's go to Cover Design Live. We'll just drag this photo out here. We need to kind of back up so we can see the whole thing. Click that little chain link and then you can really Balloon it up to fill up the whole the whole thing. Just like that. Click place. We're going to zoom back in. Let's uh you don't need to see a there we go. It's gonna be better. Okay. And we'll just uh, recreate it. It's gonna be easy. It's gonna be uh, forgotten, and we'll just put that there. Pump it up. Apply. Set a trajan. We'll go down to fog lighten. Fog lighten number four. Let me get nice and big. I could probably do a lot better text effects with Photoshop. Same thing here. Sandra, what I don't remember the name we picked up. Sandra Stone. Uh, you want to pick different fonts for the 
author name. Um, so for this one, I'm gonna let's change the font. Let's do see, see if I can find one that's like more degraded than chat book. A little less cheesy looking. And these grunge fonts, that's kind of what you want for something like this. And you can also just do like a simple sans serif. You can't really go wrong with, with the, the sans serif or a simple serif font. I just have something in my mind that I can't, can't fully make real here. You just do, yeah, let's do, yeah, we'll just do Trajan. Um, that looks fine. It's a good title font. It works for an author name too. Uh, I'm gonna do, so if, I'll, I'll come up with a list of fonts that you guys should have that are basic fonts. Um, There's one I'm thinking of here that I use a lot. Cormorant, Cormorant looks good. Actually, I like that Cormorant Unicase. Looks good for this one. And we'll just kind of size that up a bit. Down here, there you go. Um, now for this, we're gonna do this with overlay. So first thing we're gonna do is like a gradient overlay and uh, pop up this layer style See, I have a bunch of different gradients already set up that I use frequently. And so we can start with one of those, like this one, and just kind of go from there. You can actually do better gradients in Inkscape, believe it or not, than, um, than you can in Photoshop. Uh, it's actually quite a bit more difficult to do the same amount in Photoshop uh, that you do in Inkscape. But we can, do, at the same time, we can do lots of different, like better drop shadows that are a little bit more, you know, this color burn effect just looks really cool for something like this. And we can just make it less opaque. Like that. And then we can have a regular drop shadow down here too. That's gonna be a little bit more kind of foggy, a little bit less distance from this, you know, and turn it down. Just a bit. And we can even do one more that's gonna be, say, like really spread out like this, that has kind of a glow to it. And I'm gonna change that color to like a light blue, okay? And uh, we can add in a little of adjustments. Let's go to hue, and we can just bump the hue to like wherever we want it to be, like a blue. Oh, I didn't save that, whoops. Go. Boop, boop, boop. There you go. We do this all like, you know, you can desaturate it. You can kind of just kind of dial in the perfect color here, purple or blue. Uh, which is gonna work good. Now, another thing, this is what's kind of cool, something I can do here. Um, I'll just show you real quick. Let's turn that off and uh, kind of zoom in here. We can actually use a tool here. It's like an auto selector and we can just select her and uh, select her sleeve there. See if we can get her, the whole part of her in more or less, Let's get her hair and um, you just kind of get some of the grass here. Fortunately, grass kind of makes it harder. You have to be a little bit more detailed, but I will do this one kind of quick and dirty. Um, so I copied and pasted her on top, and I can put this hue and saturation right here, and you can see it didn't really change her. And then I could put another one right here, um, hue and saturation, and just we're gonna stick it to just this layer, and then we can kind of do that from here. Uh, or just like make her completely desaturated and make everything else uh, here like really 
saturate, you know, whatever you want to do. So you could actually make her like different colors or anything like that, you know, which also means you can, you know, we could do something like, um, you know, like a motion blur, uh, you know, something like, it's just kind of weird. You can do that too. Um, in fact, we can actually do this. I'm going to paste her layer again. I don't know why that. Just turn that adjustment layer off. Now we can do one that's um, going to be right on top like this and blur. Do like a Gaussian blur. I'm spending too much time on this. Nah, that's not good. Blur. Uh, motion blur. Motion blur is what it's going to do. Okay. And kind of turn it up like that. Now from here, what we do is we could just put it slightly to the side and just turn down the opacity a bit. Or even better, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll go to inner glow like this. Uh, is that an inner glow? Let's do inner shadow like that. I'll change the color. Let's make it kind of a purple, purpley color. I'm being too creative here. I'm going, you shouldn't do this. But uh, we're going to make it just very, uh, very kind of blurry here. See? And then she just kind of has a, a sh she's just kind of shadowed. You know, she just kind of has a shadow that is kind of around her. Um, and then from there you can actually create like a hue saturation that only affects that layer um, like this and we'll kind of saturate it up and kind of give her like a little bit different color like a uh, red probably be, probably be that so anyway that's some creative stuff that you can do Anyway, let's move on. So there's there's an example of basic book cover design. Uh, this would actually probably work fine for this cover. It wouldn't be like the best cover ever, but it'd be something that uh, anybody could do on their own. Um, let's take a look at the chat, see if I missed anything. I'm sure you guys have been chatting. The way it looks right now makes me think of unicorns. It makes me think of like the last unicorn or something. Should the text on a cover always have drop shadows as a rule? No. If it's on a really dark background, you don't need it. Um, maybe sepia would work for the title font. It actually would. That'd be a good idea. Um, I'd have done the tagline, those who entered the forest are seldom remembered. There you go. It's a good one. Oops, I sent you a cover and used the same for the author name as the title. I've got to go, but be sure to finish this later. Thanks for all your awesome help. You're you're most welcome. Blue and yellow. So um, let's talk about color wheels real quick. If you guys don't know that much about color wheels, um, if you didn't take art, there's a thing called complementary colors. So purple and yellow, if you think about the three primary colors, which is in painting, it's uh, going to be yellow, blue, and red. And then there's a color between each of those. Red and blue makes purple, red and yellow makes orange, and blue and yellow makes green. So if you go across from there, that's how you get a complementary color. So it's blue and um, orange, and it's going to be yellow and purple. It's going to be red and green. The thing is, those are too stark sometimes. So I usually get to go one over. So yellow and blue, or yellow and say red, right? So you're using primary, prim, you know, you're using one off uh, or just slightly off. So instead of yellow and blue, or instead of orange and blue, you do blue and like a burnt reddish orange, or blue and a slightly golden, slightly orange yellow. Um, if they're too if they're too strong a contrast, then it's it's a little too strong. Like this would probably work. It'd be okay. Um, it's not the best. Of course, we want to add a vignette. So let me add a vignette layer real quick. Layer new layer. Boom. Edit fill fill with black. Uh, screen. And then we're gonna go to we're just gonna add an inner shadow. And this is an, a super easy way to make a vignette. See, perfect. 
We don't want any distance here. And you can even change the color. So this is a purple color. We can go to more black color if we want. And there you go. You can even make uh, you can even make one that's like color burn, um, or that's just black. So let's make one that's just black. And we'll have the opacity there, the size smaller. We'll make the choke pretty high. So it's uh, have this one be a little bit lower opacity. There you go. So there's a vignette. Oops, I didn't save it. That's embarrassing. And we can do one that's color burn, why not? We'll make it a darker color though. We'll make it kind of a greenish color burn. And uh, just really like, there you go. There we go. There you go. There's a little bit of that. It could be done better, but it's a good place to start. You could spend hours messing with this in Photoshop, and I actually don't want to because we're starting to run out of time. Um, so anyway, there's some live cover design stuff for you guys. Um, let's talk a little bit about what you need to do. Um, and I'm going to have more. I'm going to have more cover design stuff this week. But let's talk a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what you need to be making sure that you do um, leading up to publication. So you're going to need to know how to format your document. So once you have your ebook cover. Like let's say this is your ebook cover. Um, in fact, we can just export it as a like a JPEG. Let's put it over. Um, where's the place that we could put it? I don't know. Um, what you're going to do to make this into a an actual an actual cover is. Uh, Here. So here, here it is exported as a JPEG, an ebook cover, right? It could definitely be better. I, I would probably make it better, but the design elements are there, so that's all I really wanted to show. Um, I'd have to be probably more creative. And I don't usually, I don't write in this genre, and I don't think about what's in the cover for a genre like this, but it would, might, might work, you know. Um, it's, not, it's not my best. But we, we take that, and we actually would go to... Um, part of Amazon here, which will have cover templates. And so the link here is this. What's the best way to lay out a table of contents in either Word or Google Docs? Uh, make an automatic table of contents. I'll have to, I can show you that in just a second. Um, so let's say we already have our, our like we already have something formatted. Um, you know, here's here's Voices of the Void. We'll, we'll open this one up, right? So Voices of the Void. Here's an already formatted. Here's an already formatted book interior. Um, we'll see how many pages it is. Oh, it's 95 pages. So you type in page count, 95. It's trim size, five by eight. Paper color, cream. It's probably what you want to use. You can use bright white. Bright white is probably more for nonfiction. Cream is better for fiction. Download the cover, cover template. Um, when you open it up, you're going to get this folder, 5x8 cream. And you're going to have a PDF and a PNG. So what we want to actually open here is, the, depending on which program you're using, the PDF you can open in Photoshop and then go from there or you could open the PNG in Photoshop, or you could do it in Inkscape. So if we want to do it in Inkscape, we're going to go to uh, New. Let's see if I can do actually New from Clipboard. Um, we're going to go to Import, and let's see if I can find. Let's see if I can find this. Oh my gosh. Google Drive. No, it's not going to be there. Oi, it's going to be on one of my other disks. Oh, 
it's not here. Uh, I have to I have to extract it first. I'll, I'll show you how to do it on Inkscape probably in another video. Um, but let's say we're just going to do it in in Photoshop. Uh, I'm going to open. You can go to. Uh, open and then we can open the PDF here fine fine Windows I'll, ex I'll extract this file which is zipped for no reason All right, let's try that again. All right, so now you have a new document with this template here. And what you would do is um, open file location. You just drag your cover in here and uh, make it fit. And there you go. Then you just have to fill in the other side. So we'd create a couple of dark rectangles. We put in our text. Um, we would leave our barcode here blank, and um, you know you can make guidelines just like in Inkscape and Photoshop. You make these guidelines for all the the little bleed marks that you have to to know where they're at, and then eventually you can just construct it like that. So once you know how thick it's going to be, you can download this template from Amazon, and then it's really really easy to then do the rest. You could do the same thing in Inkscape. You just have to get the image in there um, to Inkscape and then it'll work for you, okay? Please purchase a license for WinRAR. I don't I don't think I used WinRAR. I don't even know if I have WinRAR on this computer. This is, I might have it. You don't need it anymore though. Windows can just like read zip files. <laughs> All right, let me show you how to lay out a table of contents in Word. Um, let me give, let me show you a full document. Um, let's grab All right. So here's here's the complete um, the complete edition of Needle Ash. Hopefully you guys can see this. Notice that there's all of this stuff over here. So here's the easiest way to do this. This is an this is a automatic table of table of contents. This is actually what you want to use for an ebook file, but it also works great for paperback. So it works for either one. Notice that it's got a bunch of page listings. And when you have this as an ebook file, the person on the table of contents can click this and it's a hyperlink because this is actually an XML file. It works it with XML. So uh, on each chapter you notice that I have a style up here that says heading one so what you do is for your chapter headings you select them you right click them and you go to styles and you click any of the heading styles and then from there you can click that heading style and go to modify and you can pick the font and everything else so I'm using Trajan Pro 3 that's a really good title font and uh, you know size 20 font you can make it bold and then it will Format that for every single chapter heading. So you do all the chapter headings like that. And when you do that, then it also creates an entry over here in the navigation pane. And the navigation pane is basically what's going to show up in your table of contents. And from here you go, um, you would go to insert and you'd find, um, or is it page layout? Where is it? No, nope, that's not it. Header, footer, where is that? They always put this stuff in a weird place. I'm sorry, it looked like I don't know. Oh, there it is, it's under references. Under the references tab, okay. You just hit table of contents and you can go to automatic table and then from there you can just edit it to make it look exactly like you want. And it'll fill in all these dots, it'll line everything up for you and it's really easy that way. Um, 
That to me is like the best way to do it. And I just do it that way. You know, here's a map. Put a put an image in if you want to. Word's really easy to use for that. It's great for image placement. People who say Word is not good for image placement, I think just don't really know how to use Word that well. It's not the best for image placement, especially compared to something like InDesign, but it's totally adequate. About the Amazon book template, the middle section of the template, how do I know how thick it has to be depending on how long is my book? So great question. If you go to the Kindle website, you put in the page count for your formatted paperback, and then that it'll know exactly how thick it's going to be based on that page count. So this template automatically does it. So if I put in like 700 and we look at it from here, 700 pages, that's how thick the, the spine is going to be. It's going to be really thick. So it automatically sets up the spine. Now here's another thing you got to know. If there's no white space on the spine, like if it's a thin book, you may not be able to put cover text on it. Um, it's got to be certain thickness for there to be text on it or it doesn't want to print it because sometimes the printing is slightly off and you don't want to have text that's misaligned. Um, so just as an, as an example, whatever um, whatever it is, there you go. Is Amazon picky about pictures? Do they only support solid black ink or is full gray? gray? Full grayscale is supported for interior pages. However, I use just black and white and the reason is because the grayscale doesn't always come out perfectly. But if you look at any of my fantasy novels, the maps are technically grayscale. So the grayscale looks okay, um, but it's not perfect. Um, so I don't know, you probably can't see it. Let me, let me, it's, it's gonna be too bright. Maybe if I turn this light off, you can actually see it. So you can, maybe you can see that the North Sea up here is actually grayscale. Gray, grayscale looks fine. Um, actually, I could show you a much better picture. My author picture. Doing a color interior looks way, way worse. I mean, not way worse. It's way, way more expensive. So I wouldn't bother with a color interior. But a black and white interior, you can do whatever. But the the like the line art in the Needle Ash books, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. Let's see if I can find one. You know, it's nice and, and big and... Oh yeah, here's here's yeah you know, here's an illustration, right? The black and white. I had Brad do only ink, so it's just uh, it's inks only, no no grayscale comic stuff, just like pure line art. And it actually that's exactly how I wanted it to look. His, he did a great job with the pictures. Brad Lynn's the guy who illustrated this. He's kind of a he was I don't want to call him an amateur, but he's you know a guy who's still building his business, right? Um, very, very nice guy to work with. I met him through a Hema, Hema group. Um, so yeah, they support they support Grayscale. And that's all that. So yeah, so you if you do an automatic table of contents, it should work fine. Um, if you don't want to do an automatic table of contents, what you got to do here is you have to just manually put all this in, which is annoying. Uh, you can do this, it's just kind of annoying. What I'd probably do is generate an automatic table and then edit it however I wanted it to. Now I will say there's something that you need to know about formatting a paperback, which is you notice um, if we go to the first page, on the second page it says page four, three, two, one. So page one is the title, book one, Knives of Darkness. So you can start page one here or here. But in order to do that, you actually have to, to edit the, the header. Um, so different first page, different odd and even pages, and um, then you have to uh, format page number, and then you can tell what it's starting at. So start at page, start at three, and you can see that it ends up here. You know, format page numbers, start at three, or continue from previous section, and then it's going to have all the correct page numbers on it. And notice I use drop caps. If you guys want, I'll show you how to do drop caps and all that kind of stuff. And I will give, um, I will give font recommendations. Right now, my font recommendations for book interiors are going to be Times New Roman. If you absolutely can't be bothered to think of anything better, the other one is going to be E. B. Garamond. E. B. Garamond. I'll type it out. E. B. Garamond is a free font. You don't have to use Adobe Garamond. I use Adobe Garamond, but 
I, I have a I have access to it, okay? If you're gonna buy some Adobe fonts, Adobe Garamond and probably something like Minion or Arno are good choices. I use Arno for small books. So eight by five books, I use Arno. For um, bigger books, I use Adobe Garamond. So this is Adobe Garamond in this book. Uh, the original printing of Water of Awakening used E.B. Garamond and it looks great. So E.B. Garamond comes in two sizes, a 12 point and an eight point. And it's ideal, for, if you're gonna do a six by nine, E.B. Garamond is the best free font you can use. It also looks good at eight by five, but at eight by five, I think probably Times New Roman might be slightly better because it's made for narrower columns, newspaper columns. Um, is the inside or outside margin wider? So technically the inside margin is wider, but let me show you how to format that real quick, okay? So what you do here is, uh, and I'm gonna have a separate video on this for you guys. It looks like we're running out of time. I've wasted a bunch of time here, but that's how it is. Um, you go to margins, you go to custom margins, and you're gonna get a margin set up for this. This is a six by nine book. So don't use these margins for your eight by five. You wanna look at probably Voices of the Void. Uh, yeah, let's look at Voices of the Void because this is going to have the ones that I want you guys to use. So um, we go here to page layout, margins, custom margins. The top is about a half inch. Inside, outside is slightly smaller. You know, you can do half inch all the way around. It's probably fine. Um, I tweaked this to make a little bit, just slightly more room for the bigger font on my name and the, the title of the book. So 0.52 worked great for that. Inside, outside, what you want here is a gutter. So I used a quarter inch gutter. Now, the thicker the book is, the bigger the gutter needs to be. And when I look at Voices of the Void, quarter inch gutter is pretty much perfect. Uh, small books, you know, they don't need as much gutter, but I, I, I think it's okay to have a little bit more gutter. So a quarter inch gutter is gonna be good. Anything from 0.15 to like 0.3 is gonna be fine but 0.25 is probably a good gutter amount for this kind of book um, because it's it's really glued tight. So normally I would do smaller, like 0 0.18, but 0 0.25 is fine. And then you notice that this is a mirror margins is what you want. And so that's gonna make sure that the gutter is always in the middle. And uh, when you actually get your book formatted and set up, there'll be an extra quarter inch just in the, always in the middle of the book. So when you look at it, it looks really even and looks really good. You can't see it because of how bright my lights are, but um, let me, if I just pulled it, there you go. So you can see the middle, there's an extra quarter inch all the way through. And you just have to make sure that you are actually have all the right pages lined up because sometimes Word will insert a blank page. Now, like there's actually a page missing that is not displayed between Voices of the Void in the beginning here. That's fine. Uh, you have to do that with page breaks. Um, I'll show you how to do this. While I'm at here, you want to go to display. Um, you want to show all formatting marks. From there, all of your page breaks are going to show up. Notice I have section break next page. And so it should go on to just the next page there. Um, but I have it set up for odd pages. This is actually not correct. So this should actually say um, uh, insert, we're gonna go to page break, we're gonna go to um, odd page. And then it's correct, right? And so if I press return, section break, odd page, next page, this one should say next page, next page, next page, odd page. And that's all the breaks I need for this book because this one has no chapters and indeed no scene breaks. And then at the end here, um, I think there's just a next page and here it is about the author. And that's how you format your interior. Um, I'll, I'll get into really specific things I recommend, um, including fonts. So this font I believe is Arno Pro. I like Arno. So that's a good one for, for small books. And you can find an equivalent of it online um, I will say for creating the PDFs from once you have this, you're going to create a PDF. The thing is, um, I'm going to have to show you some free programs to use because if you're if you're not willing to pay for Acrobat, 
it's gonna be hard to make a PDF with certain kinds of fonts. So you can totally make a PDF with EB Garamond, but certain kinds of open type fonts will not work on uh, third party programs like PDF Maker or something like that, um, or PDF Creator. So I'll show you how to how to kind of circumvent, circum, circumvent that and make sure you're using fonts that are actually gonna work correctly. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. Okay, I think we're, we're basically about out of time. Thanks for hanging with me for this. Um, sorry, this live stream was perhaps slightly, slightly crazy as far as uh, me wasting time <laughs> showing book cover design for, for book covers that I don't think are turning out, are, are that good, you know. They look okay, you know, they look okay. It's good enough um, for, for what you would need to do. And you could spend some time really like dialing it in if you wanted to. Um, then I, that tends to be what I would do. But keep it simple, that's gonna be the rule. I'll have a couple other videos coming out this week that will show some more, just some really easy to execute cover design stuff. Um, and uh, that'll, that'll hopefully make sense to you. But it's kind of good to see people, see somebody do it live, because uh, that, you know, it's helpful, it makes a lot of sense. So um, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you guys next time. Uh, next week, we're hopefully gonna finish up publication and answer all of the remaining questions for um, what you need to do to you know, publish your book. So I will see you guys next time.